lately, I've been thinking about how a movement of embracing an ethic of interdependence could transform our communities, our nation, and our planet. The book underscores the importance of traditional ecological knowledge. And for many of us newcomers, it gives us a refreshing lens to see and experience the world. Tonight, we have an opportunity to explore some questions about the learnings from braiding sweetgrass. We'll do this in small groups and then come together for a Q&A session to discuss general themes with our guest speakers. I'm excited to introduce to you our speakers who will be sharing local indigenous perspectives of relationship to land. Carla Marie Munoz is a tribal councilwoman of the Costanoan Rumson Carmel tribe. Serving as a tribal liaison for her people for the past nine years, She's worked to build relationships between state parks, government agencies, and tribal communities. Carla Marie is focused on creating space for ceremonies, land restoration, and tribal recognition. She's dedicated herself to working with tribal youth to restore traditional knowledge. Carla Marie is a singer and an artist using shells to make contemporary jewelry and oil paint. Jana Nason, is the tribal administrator and secretary for the Esalen tribe of Monterey County. She's an eighth generation Esalen descendant and is honored to have lived the majority of her life here locally on her ancestral homelands in Big Sur and the interior mountains of Carmel Valley. Jana's deep passion to preserve her culture and traditions as well as protect her ancestral homelands has led her to the meaningful work that she does today. Linda Yamani, who is Rumson Ohlone, was not able to join us this evening. Many of you are familiar with Linda's incredible basketry work and her contributions to help sharing the story of native peoples in our region. Linda is one of the co-authors for the book, In Full View, Three Ways of Seeing California Plants. She has given us a short recording of her reading on poison oak. We will have an opportunity here shortly to hear from Carla Marie Munoz and Jana Nason, but we'll start with hearing from Linda's recording. Poison Oak. For most people, poison oak is a nuisance. For others, a serious threat to their health and well being. Like mosquitoes and ticks, it's one of those things whose purpose on earth we find easy to question. Have you noticed that we tend to measure things in terms of how they benefit or threaten us? If something benefits or pleases, it is good. If there is potential for harm, it is bad. Poison oak has become a lesson in perspective, cause for reflection, a reminder that we do not always have to be the center, the standard for whom all things are measured. For over the years, I've seen deer grazing in poison oak thickets. For them, it is not an enemy, but a sustaining friend. Likewise, deer have sustained California Indian people for uncounted generations. So I've learned to embrace poison oak, if only figuratively, appreciating it as the friend of a friend and accepting that there is value in all things, even when I cannot see it. It's helpful to get a different perspective of poison oak for sure. I, it's certainly helpful for me. <laughs> and now we'll turn to our special guests, Carla Marie Munoz and Janda Nason, who will also be sharing Indigenous perspectives. I'm Mishi Shtu, Ga Inkara Carla Marie Munoz, Gaha Kusanam Ramson Carmel Tribe, Gaha Ramson Ohlone. So my name is Carla Marie Munoz, good evening. Uh, I'm part of the Kusanam Ramson Carmel Tribe and I am a tribal councilwoman. I'm super excited to be joining you all this evening. Thank you for sharing this space with us and giving us this opportunity to talk a little bit about our create or well, our interaction and connection to the land and what it means to be indigenous, which um, to me is defined by your relationship to the land and how you have a reciprocal relationship with the land. And um, of course, I'm always in ceremony. I have been for a very long time uh, with my grandfather since I was nine years old. And he's always taught me from a very early age that you never take too much, that the you have to make sure that there's enough there for everyone and that 
there's seven generations and you are the seventh generation and you're influenced by your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents, but then you influence your children, your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. And that influence resonates on how you take care of the things around you, the land, um, the water, the air, all of these things that are very important to us and our well-being. So for a very early age, we always gave a lot of thanks. Um, our tribe in particular is not from the area. We actually moved to Southern California um, after, uh, of course, a couple of genocides in California here that um, allowed us to be safer in Southern California. So there we kind of thrived as a community. Now there's 2000 of us that live down there in Southern California. I like to say that I'm very lucky as winning the cultural lottery because I live here in the Bay Area, the land of my ancestors. And there's a lot of others in my community that could never even fathom that or even think how that could be possible. Now it is a struggle to be an indigenous woman in the Bay Area. Um, it's a struggle for this to be our ancestral land because it's hard to have access to it. It's hard um, being separated from it. Um, in Southern California, you know, we had songs for the trees and we had songs for the water, but we were never able to sit under those trees or never go to that water. So it was my own personal mission to come here in order to establish those connections. And so that we're not just dancing for the public, we're actually giving back a prayer to the land. And so when I moved here, um, I thought it would be great. It would be a lot easier to get into places and to do things. And fortunately, um, the way that the government is set up right now, the way that things are, um, we're not a recognized tribe. So we don't get all of the benefits as federally recognized people would um, as far as access to their own land, um, places to do ceremony, a lot of those um, things that are very vital to us in even gathering. Something that's so important this book expresses is the need to gather and how that's very tightly woven into being an indigenous person. Um, is that right? And that need and that access to land. And so it's very important um, that when I got here, that I connected to those places and share that with my tribal people at home that maybe would have not have gotten that experience or have never have seen that or would not have gotten access here. So it's kind of my job now to create these spaces and these dialogues in order to further assist our people in returning back so that we can sing to the land finally, so that we can sit under the shade of the tree or go to the water or even in the season gather acorn or even go and get pine nuts. You know, these wonderful things that are so beautifully woven into our culture, but now we have limited access to these sources. We have limited access to even being an a priority into these spaces. These spaces are um, governed by other people, by other entities. And unfortunately for me as an indigenous woman, that means very limited access to these places. That means that my voice um, isn't heard in a lot of spaces. And that means to the trees and to the water that's there that I long for and yearn for as a connection to that place. And so, you know, um, I go out anytime that I can, uh, any teachings that I gather for um, as far as intertwining nature with gathering willow or um, getting tuli, those kind of things I bring back to my people and I show them what it is because those things are so important to us and to our culture and to our society. So I've learned that it's not only for me, it's not only my education, it's for, um, the good of the youth and for them to carry on this knowledge and to have an authentic relationship with the land so that they're not just coming up here to dance when it's convenient and when it's ceremonial times, that they're actually up here and they're giving back. They're able to gather from the land. They're able to leave their prayer here because nine times out of 10, we don't really want to gather. We just want to be a part of and just experience because we all have been out in nature. We've all experienced the beauty of it. We're all from this beautiful land. And my ancestors came from a lot of village sites there to Kutnu, Sokoronda, uh, Ashanta, Ashanta, um, what's the other one? Oh man, um, Eshlot. All of these places is like modern day um, Santa Lucia, uh, Garland Ranch, Point Lobos. These places are so beautiful and, and great for the public but I would like access to these places as well. And I would like to go there when it's time, when the creator says it's time, when the creator tells us it's time to gather, we should go and we should do it in groups. And I wanna take my whole family, but of course we're limited now because of this COVID. So I hope everyone is staying safe out there. 
Um, I'm here because of the knowledge of my ancestors and my elders. And so right now, a lot of our elders are getting sick and they're moving on to the spirit worlds. And so um, I'm very thankful for all of their teachings and their knowledge and to have those elders that we can go to now to gain some of that knowledge back and um, just have them experience the land. It's been great to bring out my grandfather out here so that he can reimagine this landscape and really um, remember what he fought so much for and why we're gonna continue to fight today. So I know that I'm not going anywhere for a very long time and I continue to wanna have space here for my people and for my tribe. And we're very hopeful for the future, especially with the relationships that we're building, not only with the park services and the people that are in charge, but also with the local community like Jenna Nason. And it's been so beautiful to become her friend and to have this beautiful relationship blossom. And so with that, I'll say Jenna, I'll leave that to you, sis. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Carla. Saligi Atsatsano, I'm Jana Nason. I'm a member of the Eslan Tribe of Monterey County. I'm also a councilwoman and I am our tribal administrator and secretary. Um, I'm grateful to be here today uh, to join in on this conversation. I feel like it's so important because all of our lives depend deeply on the gifts of the earth. She gives us the ground to walk on, the air to breathe, the area to grow our plants and to raise our animals on. And I feel like this is really important conversation to have you know how do we give back to the earth how can we just not continue to take all the time can we give back like Carla and I do in ceremony and in prayer and in harvesting sustainably and you know gathering gathering certain materials like Carla gave me this beautiful necklace and it was a wonderful gift you know she goes out there and has ceremony and gathers these beautiful shells and nuts and is in ceremony why she's making this. She's giving thanks to the land, to the earth for offering these gifts. And then she in turn gives that gift to somebody else. So I'm not as well of a public speaker as Carla, so I'm not gonna continue on much longer, but thank you for having me. And I look forward to hearing from everybody. Wonderful, really, really great to hear from you both. And um, as some of you may be aware of and probably have heard that um, there is a, land that has been recently reclaimed by the Esalen tribe here locally. So it's a very exciting time um, for uh, many Native groups in Monterey County as that land will be able to be a place um, for them to gather privately without having to be necessarily in the public to be able to conduct ceremony um, for repatriation and uh, to be able to have a place um, for cultural ceremonies. So it's just, it's very, very exciting. So. so at this point, we're going to be breaking up into uh, smaller groups to discuss uh, breathing sweetgrass. Each group will have a, a staff member from the Big Sur Land Trust that will help facilitate the group. Uh, we'll go over a couple of questions and this is really a conversation. So. For folks who maybe haven't read the book, I know that um, we've often had folks that have joined our book club that are like, well, we just want to hear about it, but we haven't quite read the book. <laughs> we uh, Hopefully the questions are tailored uh, so that you can participate uh, either way uh, in the discussion. And then we'll come back and come together for a Q&A session, so. I'm really glad that everybody had some rich discussion. I know in, um, in our group, we had some and we heard some great stories and um, so many ways that people are connecting to this book and how it really translates into their lives today and lessons learned from it. So it was a lot of fun. Um, thanks everyone for participating. So um, I'm now going to turn it over to Kate and um, we're going to ask uh, Carla Marie and Jenna um, and just open it up uh, to any questions that you might have for them. We could talk about any general theme as well if folks would like to um, dig deeper into something um, that came out from the book. That's also um, an opportunity. Uh, so uh, I'll hand it over to you, Kate. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, we thought we'd start with uh, this first question that we have, which is in the book, Kimmerer talks about the forced loss of culture, language, and connection to place. Thinking about the revitalization of and celebration of being indigenous now as a form of healing, what are some of the ways that you have seen this in your own experience and your community? So we all kind of know quite a bit about the mission system and um, our cultures, Carla's and my culture, 
was severely impacted by that. Um, we weren't able to sing our own songs. We had to leave our land. Um, a lot of families were separated from each other. Um, we, you know, a lot of our culture, a lot of our language wasn't allowed to be spoken and performed there at the mission. So it, a lot of it was lost. And so a lot of, and a lot of people had to leave, leave their homelands. And so part of what the Esalen tribe is striving to do now is to encourage those people to come back to their homelands and we invite them to come to the Esalen tribal lands to renew their connection and to deepen their connection into a place for all of us to keep practicing our culture and to pass on our traditions. You know, it's through the, through our elders and through our generation and the next generation that we will be able to continue these things. So I would say that part of um, our own tribal um, revitalization of our culture that was lost, like Jenna said, there was a huge devastation that happened here. It didn't just stop at the missions. It continued on into the Mexican-American War, the gold rush, all of these things decimated our culture in so many ways. And even now, so just consumer society has definitely put a damper on our culture and practicing. I can't even go down to the water and offer a song without being on display and everybody looking in a certain way or manner like, what is this crazy lady doing with her shells and her clapper stick singing to the water? But it's, it's that exact thing that we are trying to change and normalize, you know, that it is important to give back in these ways to the water. And, and, and even though it is a show given to everyone, I don't care, I'll put on the show because it's necessary for the land and it's necessary for the water. And so some of the ways that we're revitalizing our culture within our own tribe is by hosting events that are gatherings, right? So we have our big time gathering in San Francisco and we invite a lot of our neighboring um, brethren to come and share their culture on a platform where we stay the night with each other for three days. We share for these three days and we eat as a community. We uh, pray as a community and that's how we revitalize our culture and we show the next generation that we need these spaces. We need these spaces. And now that space there is on borrowed time from the city of San Francisco. You know, the Presidio allows us to to stay there for a certain amount of time. We have to bid for that. So with this new opportunity with this land, this is our opportunity now that we can start having our own ceremonies of being on our own time. So that's just amazing in itself. And this opportunity of revitalization is just coming because we're ready. As the youth experiences being here and uh, having culture and being assured in who they are, they're really excited to come back and connect to a land where they're gonna display that culture. And so um, we're on the forefront of a revolution that I feel, which is bringing our people back to the places that they need to go. And so I'm very thankful for that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, you know, both of you have shared uh, your involvement in your tribes or, or, or connection to the tribal council and leadership roles that you're taking on or, or advocacy roles, um, you know, be it public speaking or behind the scenes. How did you um, answer the call to do this work? How did, how did this become part of what you, you do? Part of it is really, you know, lessons and teachings that our ancestors passed on to us. And it's easy for those things to slip away if we don't continue to practice them. Um, and part of it for me was through my educational learnings, you know, even in the fourth grade and the middle school, the information that we're taught um, isn't always the, the real history. And a lot of times your, your, first, your first teaching of something, your first impression of it is what sticks with you. And so I really, the calling for me was really to spread awareness um, and to help bring indigenous people back to their homelands, you know, give them a space to have ceremony, help, you know, give our elders a place, a private place to teach us, you know, so we can, we can continue on with those traditions. Um, and part of it for me was really just, I know that it's, it's my soul work. It's what I meant to do is to help preserve land and to help preserve our cultural heritage and our traditions. You know, it's, it's hard in our everyday lives to really focus on, um, how do I explain this? It's hard in our everyday lives to kind of do what we really feel is important. Sometimes we get distracted with making money and feeding ourselves. And so for me, the, it, what brought me to this was that it's so important. This work is so important. So that, that's how I got here today. 
So my answer to my calling, um, I would say, you know, because I had the luxury of like being in ceremony a lot with my grandfather and standing next to him. Um, I never really felt uh, because I grew up in a community that supported me and uh, gave me a lot of option that I never really thought uh, about being very active in my community because it seemed like the work was already getting done. Um, and it, for the most part it was, and it was through the leadership of my grandfather. He was doing a lot of this work on himself and I never realized that because it was all effortlessly getting done and it all seemed to uh, be moving in a wonderful direction. And then unfortunately, about four years ago, my grandfather suffered a stroke. And so when he suffered the stroke, he really um, took a step back in leadership. It was really hard for him. And so when he took the step back, I was almost forced to take the step up because I stood next to him for so long and I was able to embody some of his teachings that he gave to all of our people. And so um, I wouldn't say that I'm actively taking the chief role. Uh, I'm definitely a supporting character on this cast of um, people involved in making this happen, but I'm definitely... Um, I realized what his vision was and I, I and I get it. I, I totally understand now in my older age and caring for the future and um, responsible for what we present into the world because for the longest time he was about recognition and like everybody look at us, we still exist. And now we're here. Now he showed that we are here. So now what? Now what is the next thing? And that's where I feel my calling is now is providing that space that yeah we're still here but now we need an, a, an authentic interaction with the land and so that's what um, we provide and me and my sister we go around and do land acknowledgements all over the bay area and talk about our people and talk about um, us in a present tense not in a past tense because we're still here we're still contributing things there's a lot of things that we give to our tribe as far as like restoration projects and then of course a youth summit that um, is necessary for the youth to get back involved into their traditional ways and so that was my calling that I got from answering the call from my grandpa and that's what started getting me uh, involved in this work was understanding that I grew up in a community that supported me and I want to provide a stable community for the next generation to come up in and that's very important that we have all these aunties with knowledge and all these uncles with knowledge and just feeding them to the kids so much so that they don't know what to do with it and so that's kind of where my answer to my call came from. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and so we have a question here um, about the song, Carla Marie, that you sang. And so um, in the book, uh, Kimmer, talks, Kimmer talks about how difficult it was for her to learn um, her language. And so, um, and, and I believe she said there were six elders that knew the language and then they were working hard to teach everyone um, their language. And so the question is around, you know, how do you find in your tribe, how is the language? Is it, you know, you mentioned you've learned so much from your grandfather. Is it widely known um, with folks in your tribe? Is it something that you're concerned about? But then also, could you translate or share a bit more about the song that you opened with? No, no, <laughs> I will not. You have to keep guessing. You just got to convey the feeling. Um, there's this thing that we do as indigenous people. We say, oh, if we appreciate something. Um, and so I've always been taught that it feels good and you hear it and it sounds good and it resonates in your heart and it feels good. And then it feels good in your stomach. You let out a big O from that stomach, right? Of appreciation. So I feel like it doesn't matter what the song was about or even you know what it says. It's the feeling behind it because creation fills vibration. So whatever you got from it I hope you got a lot from it but <laughs> I will say it was you know it was about the sun and, and it's very important that we start our day acknowledging that the sun powers us and that at the end it's time for the night sun to come in our language or Beto Ishman and that's Ramsen uh, Janice Eslin so I don't want to say our language that way but in my language uh, Ramsen or Beto Ishman is the night sun and that's a totally different way of entering in instead of it being a moon a whole a different entity it's actually another version of the sun so um, we sing to him often or to her or grandmother. Um, so, and that was the song. I would say language revitalization is something that uh, is happening every day. Our last fluent speaker died in 1939. Um, and so, but from them, we have recordings, uh, wax cylinder recordings from Harrington's notes. Our people have been documented 
well uh, by a lot of ethnographers. Um, and so, and they kept a lot of language. Unfortunately for me personally, I feel like a lot of the um, language that was recorded is all influenced by firsthand people. So I feel like an ethnographer that would come in wouldn't necessarily ask the same questions of people that I would ask and get. And so that almost influences their perspective and the language that was received. So I take things uh, um, in uh, and, but I also take in a lot of um, stories that we hear from our elders and things that we hear from them because that's very important too. So language, you know, I can count to 10. I can say, hi, how are you? Simple things. I can carry on a very simple conversation, but it's it's lost within our own community and we're working to revitalize that right now. And there's a lot of people working to revitalize that and give it to us in a way that we can all comprehend. And so um, for me personally, uh, it's a goal because I know it's a key to unlocking so many things. Um, a lot of our songs that we sing, I can tell you uh, the words and the meanings of them, um, but that's not necessarily the intent behind them. And so um, most of our songs uh, I will share is their gratitude songs. In our territory, as you all might understand, um, it's an abundance of beautiful things. We had trees, we had valleys, we had rivers, we had mountains, we had all these beautiful abundance of things that we never really had to ask for things to come. We never had to ask for the rain or for the buffalo, none of these things. So most of our songs are of appreciation to these things. And so unlocking those meanings and then relaying those, I feel like it's almost another form of language and that's through vibration. And so um, I would say in that aspect, I'm rich in a little bit of things, but unfortunately there's a lot more that I'm still learning and I'm learning every day and I'm not gonna stop. We have a question from uh, Maria is, what direction would you steer someone in if they wanted to learn more about the local indigenous tribes and the culture of our area? Another part of that question is, what resources would you recommend for how we can be good allies to our local tribes? So, you know, sort of this general idea of, of being supportive allies. I would start off by, you know, recommending a few books, one being the book that Gary Briskini and Trudy Haverstadt wrote on the Esalen people of the Monterey of the Big Sur area. That's a wonderful book. And it really goes over um, quite a bit of history. It talks about the culture. It talks about um, the land, talks about people's connection to place. I mean, it really gives you a kind of a a kind of brief in a way because it doesn't go in depth as far as certain topics, but it's a beautiful book. And Gary Briskini spent about 40, 40 or 50 years of his life just, study, just studying the history and the indigenous people of the Monterey Peninsula. So that's a great place to start. Um, there's also some wonderful publications by, uh, I think Carla, you said Harrington, Milken. There's a few of them. I would start with that. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, our tribe has a website. We try to post information on there that you can learn from and then reaching out. You know, we're, we're happy to answer questions. We're happy to share with you. So that's that's a good place to start. Great. So I would say land acknowledgement is a really good thing. I think that um, a lot of people have access to different sources or communities that maybe we don't have access or sources to. And so providing those to us would be great. I know um, last year, or I think it was the year before I got to open up the Big Sur Fashion Show and talk about the importance of the land that we were standing on and any opportunities that we get in those ways to express who we are, to have these platforms a little bit about our back history is very important about being a good ally. It's making space for that. Um, and then another thing is opening up your land to us. A lot of you own a lot of beautiful land in our area and have a lot of beautiful food source, maybe like acorn or pine nut or bay laurel nuts or anything of those sorts. And if you have that, you maintain that in your area, it would be great to know if you could share that with us. You know, that we would love that. The other day I was in search of acorn and, uh, you know, I found very little bit of acorn that was actually useful to us. And that's something that I would like um, to have for me in general to learn and to make mesh and it would be great to do that with Jenna but uh, you know that was why I was looking for it and instead I had to go to the store to go buy it but you know it would be great if you have any access to source you know to share that source in a respectful way we're not saying you know give up your house or anything but we're saying you know anything <laughs> that, that you have it would be great because we don't have much and we don't have an authentic relationship and we're trying to build that and so to be a good ally is to know that this the land in which you stand on was not inhabited just by one people. It was a collective of a lot of different people that stayed in that area. And so it's very important to know the histories that happened there. And of course, the secularization that happened after. And um, it's very important um, to see any 
causes that we may have, like, you know, fighting for our land, the dams, the uh, salmon, all of these beautiful things that are so abundant there, any causes like that, that you can fight on our behalf, we would love because sometimes we can't always make it to these hearings or anything like that. And maybe you might have a better idea of place and purpose. And so it's nice to advocate for indigenous rights. It's nice to advocate for indigenous um, occupancy also. And so anything that you can do to advocate for that would be amazing. Wonderful. Thank you. So we do have a question here for Jana again is this question of where is the Echelon land? So where uh, I know it was formerly known as um, Adler Ranch, so that might help some folks, but if you could just tell us a little bit more. Sure, of course. Um, if you're not familiar with the area or if you are, it is if you drive south on Highway 1 and you pass Rocky Point Restaurant, you'll continue and uh, Paula Colorado Road will be there on the left. You will continue to take that road um, past where it's closed off. Now you go to the very end and you would access our land from the Boucher's Gap parking lot. And it is bordered by the Los Padres National Forest, the Mill Creek Redwood Preserve, and a few private land owners. And it sits directly northwest of Pico Blanco. So you can also see kind of the ridge tops of the, the tribe's land if you're continuing to drive south on Highway 1 and you're looking up towards Pico Blanco, you can see our land. It'll be directly to the left of that if you're looking at Pico Blanco. There's there's a couple themes here that I've seen in the questions and it talks about the um, you know elementary school teaching and, and sort of the history that we're taught uh, in, in you know the school setting. And so you know you think about sort of reconciling the Western teachings, right, of, of what you're told in school or what you're, you know, what is um, the pro prevailing message that you hear, how to reconcile that with the traditional knowledge imparted on you and the experiences that you um, have learned through your elders. Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> There, Carla Marie. <laughs> Part of it was. Um, Both of you can say if you don't if you don't have an answer for it. You know, maybe it's too painful. Maybe it's hard to answer. I don't know. I don't. You know, I don't want to pressure either of you. Certainly. Right. I would say that everything that they taught us in school made me feel like I didn't exist. Everything that they taught in school, um, as far as curriculum and everything, made it sound like we were just so excited to make those missions and like. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of mistold history or even the fact that maybe like we have to celebrate Thanksgiving and that Thanksgiving didn't even happen on this side. I think that was the East Coast, our other brethren over there, but we had a whole other atrocity here. So um, I feel like there's a lot of truth in history that's not being told. Um, I think that for us, um, well, me and I'm going to speak as a first person uh, growing up and knowing that I was indigenous, I always felt like I should have been receiving money or own a casino because I was indigenous, but that really had nothing to do about just what I was being taught or that we lived in a teepee, right? And, and down South, what did they know about what we did up North? They had no idea. So they're just talking about Indian history as American history as a broad sense of like just um, what happened in the wild west only but not necessarily particular to an area and so I think that now um, me and my sister in particular we go to a lot of schools in the Bay Area and we talk about our own history and we talk from anywhere from preschoolers to fourth graders to today we had um, a talk with UCLA and the staff there and so there's a lot of education that we're trying to um, talk about including but not limited to we're still here we still exist we didn't come in a tule boat uh, we don't all live in this big happy community where we all just laugh and tell jokes there we literally have to pull really hard to come together and so um, I think a lot of the truth in uh, the schools need to be changed and there's a lot of people out there um, I know that there's a book on Ohlone history it's called the Ohlone curriculum and that's a good circulation because it goes from kindergarten to uh, high school and about what kids should be knowing about their relationship with the land and the people that were there before them and so um, I'm very glad for this time um, I'm ready for policy change <laughs> forget education I'm ready for policy change so I mean um, there's a lot of things that anger me as an indigenous woman but you know we do the little things that we can to kind of tell first person hand so that maybe people will have more sympathy to tell our story and not just the story that they've learned mm -hmm. and for me kind of part of reconciling it was um, the teachings that were kind of brought to my educational curriculum were uh, 
the Esalen people are extinct. And so in school, when, when our teachers told us that, I didn't say anything at that moment, being a young, shy kid, but I went home and told my family and they were irate. They basically went and knocked on the doors of the school and they said, hey, we're not gonna allow you to teach us the children. What we're gonna do is we're gonna invite your whole school to come up to our land and we're gonna show them that what our traditions are. So we had a roundhouse up there and we basically did kids camps from there on out to teach them about our culture. So that was kind of my family's way of reconciling and saying, hey, let's teach them the way, let's show them the way. You know, it's, we can't generalize all indigenous people. We, you know, if we're focusing on our local history, let's focus on our local history. Are there other areas or institutions or, or things that you think about in, we need to build awareness or we need to build um, access? I can think of a few ideas. Um, you know, offer to join one of our committees. We have educational committees. We have we, we have all sorts of committees, and we um, would love help from other people in kind of organizing our thoughts in in what we want to do. You know, there's with a lot of our um, tribal councils, it's it's really just a few of us who really try to get all of our ideas out there. But a lot of times we're we're so impacted with with other projects and things that we need to do that we're not totally able to you know go all the directions that we want so a way to be our ally is to offer your time in helping us either write documents or get you know help us plan a way to get out and spread awareness I think that's a that's a great first step so I would like visual awareness that would be something that we would like um, I think that people need to see us more often we had the opportunity of dancing in sand city for indigenous people's um, weekend um, but I think that there needs to be more opportunity uh, for that for us to kind of showcase our culture and who we are and what we do whether it be through our dance and our song because of course that's the romantic side of being uh, indigenous but then also through our art as an my as an artist myself I think um, these spaces to kind of show a little bit more about who we are through our art is also very important because I know even uh, Linda who was on this uh, call she's a very gifted artist with basketry and boats and all these beautiful things to have a place to like showcase these different arts that we all do whether it be traditional or modern is also a good way because every artist has a story to tell and, and a pain that they're expressing and so it's good to kind of give that realm and I know that there's a lot of youth artists in our tribe especially that we like to highlight and showcase and so any um revenues in that way uh we like to participate in parades <laughs> and you know public awareness so any like um anything that you know of like that's locally happening that you think that we should be there giving a land acknowledgement even to let us know like hey maybe you should check this festival out maybe it's a good idea that you come over here and show some awareness or set up a table or even provide that table for us would be great you know and give out information on how to support our tribe is really good as well and I can add to that a little bit as far as the park service um, I can share a project that Carla and I have been working on with Point Lobos and it's not just Carla and I but um, a lot of the other local indigenous leaders of Point Lobos came to us and they wanted to know how they can best represent the history of our people there so we've been in a long discussion and we would love to see more plaques up there at Point Lobos talking about the history, talking about the land, talking about people's connection to place, showing them a tree, showing them where the acorns fall in a, a nice, beautiful artistic diagram of the process of processing the acorns. Um, little steps like that, you know, Park Service have been reaching out and I feel like that's a great way for us to spread more awareness. When we do ceremony, um, a lot of the songs that we do is to call in the spirits of our ancestors to join us. And when we say like to all our relations, we're not just talking about the actual physical um, people, we're actually talking about the animal spirit, the water spirit, all of these different spirits and relations that we're calling into our circle to hear our prayer. And so we invite all of the spirits of our ancestors to join us. And so we use the clapper stick when we sing. And so um, usually that invites all the spirits. And when we're done, we stop and the clapping actually scares 
them away. So when we show an appreciation for them, we do it from that place within our heart, within our stomach and within our mind that shows that appreciation and gives out that big O. And, and that's something that resonates because all creation fills vibration. I'd love to just share a prayer. This is in our um, Esalen language. Ike neshmete, Ike nesh iapa, Kwelmehe enike at satsano, Lakai nesh mepeleno, Lech amishaha no alpa, Lakai chapishi no alpa, Lakai kalu no alpa, Las name yakiski, Le mepele namoeske, Lakai le masiana, Ike. Oh. oh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. This has just been such an enriching discussion. Uh, thanks to um, all of you for taking the time to spend with us this evening. You know, there's, um, there's so much to be learned from each other and from, you know, really understanding Indigenous perspective. Uh, and I see this, you know, I think we're all feeling this sort of sea change in so much, including the way that conservation functions um, and the way that uh, conservation uh, really is... Um, you know, evolving in some ways to, you know, really rethink how we're doing everything um, in this work uh, so that we can move forward in a way that is, um, you know, really in, you know, in, in line um, with, uh, with the way that uh, will make the world a better place uh, and our communities, um, you know, just richer. So um, I'm, I'm excited about all of this and uh, excited too for, you know, building our partnerships with local tribes here. Uh, it's been really wonderful to get to know Carla Maria and Jana. Uh, we're going to close uh, with a song um, uh, from Carla Marie. So. so a song that I wanted to leave you with is a good luck song um, in our recordings uh, that we were provided by J.P. Harrington. There was a lot of songs recorded. Most had to do with love and a lot of them had to do with luck. And that's because our people were gamblers and we used to like to gamble for a lot of things. And I think that um, in this uh, life that we all live, it's a gamble we all take. And so I just want to wish us all luck on it. So this is one of the songs for luck. <clears throat> Thank you for the space, everybody. Thank you, Shururu.